Hey guys, welcome to a new video. In case you're wondering why we are all of a sudden talking about medieval Irish manuscripts, I basically did my back in at the gym a while back. For a couple of days, I was barely able to move. So when that happened, I put out this community post asking if you guys had any topics for, you know, sit down videos that I could do, things that I could talk about, maybe a classic good old tea time video. And I was surprised to see quite a few people were interested in Celtic studies and my experience with it. Uh, so that is what I'm going to talk about today. So I put out another community post, you know, to give you the opportunity to ask questions. And that is what we are going to discuss today. So before we get started, I do just want to say something very important. Um, I graduated Celtic studies in 2014 and have not been involved with either the field or the bachelor program that I did since then. So the information that I have is a little bit dated. Please keep that in mind. It might not be what things are currently like. Maybe it's good to start with a general introduction before I jump into the questions. So I studied Celtic languages and culture, that's what it was officially called, at Utrecht University from 2011 to 2014. Um, and I have a bachelor's degree in Celtic studies. I really enjoyed it, but I did not go on to do my master's in the same field or any field actually because I found out that the academic world is just not for me <laughs> and I was ready to get out of school. So that is kind of my background I guess with Celtic studies. So let's jump into the questions. One thing I loved about that community thing is that you guys can thumbs up questions that you agree with so I have a little bit of idea which questions are most interesting to you guys. All right, was learning Celtic languages such as Gaelic a part of your program and how large was the breadth of study? How far back into ancient times and how much towards the modern era? The degree that I did was more or less medieval Irish and Welsh philology. I think that is the most compact description I can give. So it was mostly focused around Old Irish, Middle Welsh, the languages themselves, and then the written texts that we have from that time. We mostly focused on tales, because those are just the most interesting and fun to translate. <laughs> but we also did a little bit of history and some kind of more general stuff. So a lot of what we did was translating Old Irish and Middle Welsh. But to answer this question, there was one course in the beginning of the program that dealt with uh, prehistoric Celts and kind of mainland Europe Celts. But that was just very brief. We didn't learn that much about them. We mostly focused on the Middle Ages and that would be from the time when Old Irish was a language, moving into the kind of earlier stages of Middle Irish. And for Welsh, it was just Middle Welsh. So Old Irish was used approximately from 600 to 900. And I think we read texts going up to around 1200. And Middle Welsh was used from the 12th to the 15th centuries approximately. And um, we studied those specific languages because they are the earliest forms of the language that we have a lot of material on. And when it comes to history, we didn't have a lot of history. I think there were only a couple of courses, one for Ireland, one for Wales. And we went over more modern history just very briefly. But uh, again, mainly focused on the Middle Ages. How many years were you in university for it? And is it about the same as other degrees? So as I mentioned, I was in university for three years, which is a fairly normal amount of time for a Bachelor of Arts. What was the hardest project or assignment you worked on? I remember one thing that was the hardest by far. <laughs> I struggled with that the most and that was translating the later forms of Old Irish that are kind of slowly morphing into Middle Irish that I struggled with a lot. Um, basically that is one of the few things I just could not get down and I don't feel like I have succeeded. I had to redo that course as well because <laughs> I just couldn't get it. I don't think there was any particular assignment. It was just that whole concept <laughs> that I really struggled with. Did your parents support your decision of studying Celtic studies? Uh, did you experience any pressure to study something else? No, my parents were lovely about it. They were always very supportive of whatever I would choose to study. Um, they just wanted me to get a degree in something and they didn't really care what it was in. And if I am able to finish it in a pleasant way and do something that I really enjoy doing, all the better for it. They were always very supportive. 
Is it a competitive program? Like, are there limited jobs after so people would want to have the highest grades or something like that? Basically, there are no specific jobs, as far as I'm aware, that require a degree in Celtic studies. The only thing you could do that is directly related to Celtic studies is to be an academic in the field of Celtic studies, uh, which is kind of what the course prepares you for, such as many university studies do. Um, at least here in the Netherlands. <laughs> That's pretty much how it works, um, especially in arts. If you want a job directly related to Celtic studies, you have to go on to do a PhD and then, you know, do research and stuff like that. That was never my personal goal and there aren't many people who aspire to an academic career, even in Celtic studies. Didn't really experience that as an issue. There aren't many people that study Celtic studies. I believe there are only a couple of universities in continental Europe that even offer the course. Utrecht University is the only one in the Netherlands. It's quite uncommon and I only had six classmates um, in my year, like my, my whole year, <laughs> it was just six people. People were very fanatic <laughs> about studying but that was just out of interest and um, because they enjoyed it, not because, you know, of any consequences directly. What did you enjoy the most about your time in university? I loved learning so much. I followed a couple uh, art history classes and I did some more general kind of classes as well. I believe I did Greek mythology, uh, Old English that I really enjoyed. I also did Old Norse and just I, I did a bunch of different courses and I just loved learning about all of these amazing fascinating subjects that not many people know about. <laughs> it was just it was so much fun. I really did not enjoy um, doing tests and writing assignments often. That wasn't really my thing, but if I could have just sat there and soaked up all of that information and knowledge, I would have loved to stay there for another 10 years. I spent one year on the board of the Study Association for Celtic Studies in Utrecht and that was so much fun. I got to spend a lot of time with my friends doing really fun stuff and um, yeah, it was just a great time all around. Why did you choose Celtic Studies? Okay, this is gonna be a bit of an embarrassing story. <laughs> Basically, uh, I've, as you guys know, I'm a huge Tolkien fan and I was obsessed with all things Tolkien and Middle-earth um, at a certain point when I was in high school. And I had read somewhere that Sindarin, the elvish tongue, is uh, loosely based off of Welsh. <laughs> Then I somehow randomly, I don't even remember how exactly, I found out that Celtic studies exist and that you can learn Welsh in like a serious academic setting, just like legitimately. And uh, yeah, I decided that that was really, really cool. So I went to the introduction thing day at the university and they gave us examples of Welsh and Irish and some examples of the insane tales that we have from medieval Ironton Wales and I fell in love and I knew that this is it. This is it. I can't go on to study anything else now. <laughs> now that I know that this exists, I have to do it. Um, even though it was very, very unrelated to anything Tolkien, it was so much fun anyway. How did you find the courage to study a rather unconventional subject. I don't think it really took courage from me. I think I maybe even enjoyed it more because it was unconventional. I kind of, I, I just, I like that. <laughs> Did you have a career in mind when you decided you wanted to study Celtic studies or was it pure interest? It was pure interest. All of the other fields of study that I was considering would have been equally lacking in job opportunities, let's put it that way. <laughs> Basically, I don't know what this is like in other countries, but in the Netherlands, when you go to university, you don't generally go there to learn a job or to prepare for a certain job unless you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or like an accountant or something. Usually universities are meant to prepare people for the academic world and the sciences. So when you study things like, you know, languages and culture, history, or even things like math, um, there aren't necessarily any direct jobs that are derived from that. So I knew that pretty much going into this when I decided that I did want to go to university. My goal was never to come out of it with a job. So no, I really chose this field just out of interest. If you hadn't had YouTube, your blog, etc., do you think you would have found a way to use your degree and the things you learned at uni to make money and support yourself? It's not like you come out of, you know, three years of university with nothing. You learn so many skills. 
um, different ways of thinking, different ways of engaging your brain, perseverance, practical skills, like, you know, writing, research, things like that. Uh, but also, you know, presenting skills, cooperative skills. And there is so much more kind of life stuff that you learn from going through university, regardless of what you study. And those skills can definitely be put into practice in, you know, whatever job you choose to do in the future. So I wasn't really ever worried about that, although I didn't have any specific career in mind because I was already pretty deep into my YouTube career by the time I started university. What is your experience with student loans, debt and scholarships? Do you think the Dutch student finances system is well organized or could it be better? I studied in the time when we still had the scholarships. Basically for anyone who isn't Dutch or doesn't know, we had a pretty solid scholarship system where the government loans you money and if you graduate within a certain period of time you get granted that money you don't have to pay it back and you could choose to get extra loans on top of that in case you needed more money to support yourself during that time of studying which I personally didn't do so I only took kind of like a basic student scholarship and I didn't have to pay anything back so I graduated without a debt. A few years after I graduated, very shortly after, they changed that system to be just loans so you still get some money from the government but you do have to pay it back afterwards. But I do still think that compared to other parts of the world the system is pretty good. Our universities, again in the grand scheme of things compared to other countries, are not that expensive. I believe tuition is around 2,000 euros a year, which is a lot of money, of course, but it's not nearly as much as it is in some other countries. On to some fun stuff. Did you get to visit any historic Celtic sites? Pictures, please. Let's preface this by saying that my experience with ancient Celtic sites is very underwhelming. Um, again, I was only in the field for three years as a very young student, so I didn't get to do much of this stuff other than just kind of being, oh, we get to visit this site. So honestly, the only experiences I have with this are through those guided bus tours that you can take in Dublin, but it was so much fun. My first academic year we went to Dublin as I mentioned and we took one of those tours and we got to see a bunch of historical sites, Boyne Valley, Bruna Boyne, we got to see Newgrange, we got to go inside Newgrange which that was amazing let me tell you that that was really really cool but honestly the highlight for me was the Hill of Tara which is basically just a grassy hill. It doesn't look like much but it has such massive significance in just anything related to medieval Ireland. Basically when you start reading the tales from that time that are documented in the manuscripts and everything, the Hill of Tara was the place where kings were crowned, just a place that returns in so many of the tales and it is such a important thing. People would travel there from the entire country and important stuff would happen there. It carries massive significance and when we took the tour I remember we were so mad at the tour guide because she was downplaying it so much. I think she must have had tourists that were just kind of annoyed at the Hill of Tara for being basically nothing but a grassy plain. When we were on the way there, she was talking to the microphone in the bus and saying things like, you know, oh, don't expect too much, it's just a grassy hill. It's kind of really important, but you know, it's just a grassy so Yeah, we're not gonna stay too long there, be sure to dress warm. And we were like, are you kidding me? We're just gonna stay a little while because it's just a grassy hill and it was all we wanted to see so yeah It was very 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 special to actually stand on the hill of Tara. That was definitely the coolest thing What is your favorite myth or if you didn't do mythology favorite fact you never got to tell anyone? Basically, I think I need to combine this one with a, another question that came in which was do you know anything about their religion? We studied written texts mostly and what was written in those texts. Celts in general only really started writing after Christianity was introduced to the countries. So the only written records we have are from post-Christian times. So that means that we didn't really study anything about pre-Christian religions. Um, and also the stuff that is often described as myths nowadays is recorded, but it was recorded by monks, mostly Christian monks. And it is debated whether this is exactly what happened or not, but basically they recorded all the stories and all the folk tales and everything that might have been the mythology one day. They recorded them as tales and stories, fairy tales, basically. It's quite funny actually how they sometimes weave Jesus into there. <laughs> 
At the same time, there are tales about how Ireland came to be populated by the Irish. There are tales about how certain lakes came into existence and how certain hills, uh, you know, came to be. And tales that just ring very mythology-like, but they are all recorded as stories. So it's hard to confirm what parts of them were actually considered part of religion or to be true and which parts were just tales. So on to my favorite stories. Honestly, I think my favorite tale, or at least one of my favorites, is the destruction of Dadergas Hostel. Forgive me if I'm wrong, because it has been so long. There is an army planning to attack another army, and this other army is staying in a hostel, Dadergas Hostel. And that first army that is planning to attack sends someone out to go take a peek in the hostel and find out how many soldiers there are so that they know what they're up against. So one of them goes over, peeks into a window and sees the most incredible things. When he sees hills and lakes and just this whole landscape, it turns out that it's not hills and lakes and a whole landscape, but it is an eye and an ear and a nose, and it's just a giant sleeping in the room. So he goes back and he reports that. There is a lot more to that story, but this is what I really, really enjoyed about it. So I think that is one of my favorite tales. I don't even remember how it ends, probably in a bloodbath. Usually all of these tales end with just everybody dying. If not that, then the vision of Mac Conglina. So basically you have this king called Cathal and he has a demon of gluttony in his throat. So a scholar is sent from Armagh to go over and heal him from the demon of gluttony. But as he is traveling there, he is really hungry. And one night he stops over in a monastery um, and the monks there only give him a little bit of food. And he gets angry and he writes a satire about them, which was one of the highest forms of insult that you could do in medieval Ireland to someone. So he writes a satire about them. They are super annoyed, decide not to crucify him right away, but wait until the next day. And that night, Makunglina is visited in his dream by an angel who gives him a vision of a land that is entirely made of food. And the descriptions of these guys. This is one of the most hilarious things I've ever read. It speaks of doors made of dry meat, a buttery bridge. There's talk of sweet, juicy bacon <laughs> and curd and smooth pillars of old cheese. And it's just... It is wonderful. He wakes up and he goes on to, you know, remove the demon of gluttony from the king's mouth. But just these descriptions and that combined with the fact that some medieval monks wrote this down is just hilarious to me. And I absolutely love that. So that is another one of my favorite Irish tales. If you're interested in stuff like this, by the way, I highly recommend reading Ancient Irish Tales by Cross and Slover. They have a very complete and detailed and um, accurate renditions of these tales, uh, very close to the way they are actually written down in the medieval manuscripts, so definitely worth a read if you enjoy stuff like this. The Welsh Mabinogi are quite amazing as well, and the best thing is when you're translating a text and you're just working really hard, laboring away at this text, trying to figure out the grammar and the vocabulary and everything, and then when you finally have your sentence. It turns out to be something about rivers of blood on the walls. <laughs> what was your thesis topic? So I wrote my thesis about uh, Longus Magnuslan, which is a the tale of the exile of the sons of Ushlu, and it is basically the story of Deirdre, and I wrote about audience reception in relation to that particular story. So basically I tried to reconstruct how that tale would have been received by a medieval audience. Because obviously when we read a tale now, we read it from our own perspective, but I tried to kind of reconstruct roughly as much as I could um, what that perspective would have been from a medieval standpoint. If anyone's interested, the thesis is published, but it is in Dutch and I find it quite embarrassing. I honestly personally don't think it was very good, but I think everyone thinks that about their bachelor thesis, right? So yeah. <laughs> was the program taught in English or Dutch? Uh, both, depending on whether we had international students in the classroom or not. What would you have picked if you wouldn't have done Celtic studies? Art history or were you considering some quite different options before going to uni? So the plan had always been since pretty much I realized that I needed to, you know, pick something like this, I really wanted to go to the Arts Academy, learn, you know, fine arts. I even went into this kind of preparation course, I guess, that you can take in order to get a taste of what it's like to study in art school. And then I realized that it wasn't quite what I expected and what I hoped, and that this wasn't something that I would probably enjoy. So I decided not to, and I decided to go to university instead. I considered art history, indeed, regular history, 
uh, archaeology, very briefly considered philosophy, and yeah, Celtic, Celtic studies. That was pretty much it. Yeah, but I did decide on Celtic studies pretty quickly. <laughs> All right, guys, so that is it. Those are the questions that I wanted to answer today, so I really hope you enjoyed that. I hope you get maybe a little bit of a better view of what Celtic studies entails and what my experience was with it. I am very, very glad that this is what I studied, even though I don't use the information anymore. It was such a fantastic time in my life and it did leave me with a university diploma, so... <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you have any further questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I can come in the comments and answer some more questions if you like. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for loads more beauty and lifestyle content. If you'd like to support me through Patreon or my merch store, there are links in the description box below. Thank you so much for your support. There is another video here that I think you might also enjoy. You can go watch next. Thank you for watching and I'll see you very soon in my next video. Bye!